Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Now we have we spent a lot of time on why it's always God's will to heal us now, probably 25 weeks. And then we spent about 25 weeks on um, how uh, to better receive and to minister healing. And uh, we've looked at every case in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and the epistles of anybody that got healed, and how they got healed, and why they got healed. And, and we've come to a conclusion based on the Word of God that anyone that approached Jesus was always healed. There wasn't anybody that he turned away. He didn't say to somebody, you know, you got to wait. God's trying to teach you something. He healed. And, and the Bible says that Jesus didn't do anything he didn't see his Father in heaven doing. In other words, he didn't just do what he wanted. He didn't just go and, and, and uh, minister the way he wanted. He did what he saw his Father and what his Father was asking him to do. And that's huge. Everybody say, that's huge. If Jesus ministered that way, that's how we minister. We have to minister uh, by the leading of the Spirit of God. We can't just kind of do what we want in the way we want and, uh, and have the results that Jesus had. Jesus was very successful because he, he completely submitted to the Father. Is everybody in Isaiah 53? We've been looking at this for, I think, three or four weeks now. And... Um, <clears throat> This is a, an account by the prophet Isaiah of him seeing in the spirit the crucifixion, the substitution that Jesus did on our behalf. Isaiah is seeing it hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened by the spirit of God. And this is so important to understand because he saw things that those that were there at the cross did not see. Isaiah was able to see in the spirit realm things that the Roman soldiers didn't see, and those that were, the disciples didn't see it. All kinds of people didn't see it that were there, but it was going on. And, and it's recorded in this, uh, in this passage of scripture. Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? <laughs> now this is, this is just about it all right here, right? You got to believe the report of the Lord. Say, I have to believe the report of the Lord. And it says, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, the answer is those who believe the report. We get to see the arm of God in action in the way of healing if we believe the report of the Lord. Now, a lot of people today, if you ask them, do you believe that Jesus heals? A lot of people would say, well, yeah, I think Jesus heals today. Uh, but when you say, do you believe that Jesus heals everybody and he wants to heal you now? That's when it gets where people get weird. They go, well, I don't know. You know, I know good people that died and all this kind of stuff. But, but you have to understand that uh, it is the will of God to heal always. If you are sad, anxious, fearful, and hear the report of the Lord and stay sad, anxious, and fearful, it proves you don't believe it. So if people are downcast after a healing service, just boot them. Because <laughs> they're not believing anything. You know, like I, I said, you know, if you're stuck in a snowbank in your car and some guy drives by and flashes his cell phone and said, I phoned a tow truck and they'll be here in five minutes and they'll help you get out, something changes in their countenance, right? They go, whoo, thought I'd be spending the night here, right? Something changes. Well, if you believe the report of the Lord, which is, and, and if you don't know what the report of the Lord and you're watching online and you don't know what it is, the report of the Lord is he heals everybody now. Right now. <laughs> but if you don't believe that, it won't change nothing on the inside of you and it won't change anything around you. You won't change because you don't believe that. How many know mind renewal is key to believing the report of the Lord? That's why we're here every Saturday night. We've been here well over a year. Every Saturday night, believe in God, right? Yes. Renewing our mind. Yes. So that we have authority because we believe the report of the Lord. So, it, uh, uh, so if you believe the report of the Lord in the midst of pain, in the midst of a bad report, in, it puts a smile on your face. Yes. Yes, it does. People ask you how you are. You go, well, I'm healed. 
Well, they say, you look pretty sick. Well, I'm healed. And you smile, and you're not faking it because you believe the report of the Lord. Right? Right? <laughs> when you believe something, you act like it. Right? People don't have to figure out, do you believe that? You know? Because you are acting like you're a believer. Right? You know? And uh, that's what we have to do constantly. Faith is action. Way too many people in North America talking spiritual but doing nothing. Because you talk the Bible and talk spiritual means absolutely nothing if it, you don't act it out. Say, I got to act. You act on what you believe. Do you believe that? Good. So we're happy tonight, right? We have a good report. Listen to me online. If you, if you have a good report, Jesus loves you and he's going to heal you tonight. Put a smile on your face in front of that computer. Hallelujah. Verse 2. For he, this is Isaiah seeing into the realm of the spirit. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, speaking of Jesus, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus wasn't a rock star. He was, he was common. He wasn't, a, he wasn't even necessarily good looking. There was nothing about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that drew anybody's attention to him. He didn't walk around with a shining face. <laughs> you know those pictures with the glow thing around his, you know, he, he didn't have that on his head, right? Because, because he was just average. He was just, and, and Isaiah saw him and he said, he, you know, there's nothing about this guy and he's verse 3 he's despised and rejected by men he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief the, that word sorrows we've looked at in Hebrew over and over over 20 times is pains and grief is translated sicknesses over 20 times but here it says grief you just mark in your Bible sickness so it says a man of pain and acquainted with sickness and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And it says in verse, uh, uh, keep reading, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. Yeah, right on. Amen. <laughs> if that's the only verse in the Bible you ever learn yeah. and you're sick. Surely has borne my griefs or sicknesses and diseases and carried our pains he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains yet we esteemed him stricken smitten my god and afflicted verse 5 but he was wounded for not anything he did our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities he the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him, and by his stripes we are healed tonight. Hallelujah. We are healed. In 1 Peter 2.24, Peter says, he, he, the only thing he changes, he says, by his stripes we were healed. Because Peter's on the other side of the cross. Isaiah's on the Old Testament side of the cross, and he says, we are healed, and Peter says, we were healed. 2,000 years ago, we were healed at Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then it goes into this lengthy, well, let's skip down to verse 10. 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to sickness. That word grief is sickness. Say, say God put Jesus to sickness. See, that's the part that couldn't be seen at the cross. They, we, we look at the physical things, that the whippings and the scourgings and all those things that were on the outside of Jesus' body. But God was happy to put a, a beating of sickness on his spirit. God was pleased to put sickness on his son's spirit. <clears throat> and what pleased him about it was he could look past it and realize that this would be the provision for the entire planet if they would believe to walk in divine health. Glory be to God. Aren't you happy? Now that's a good report. <laughs> Say that's a really good report. 
So I'm happy about that. Hallelujah. So, so he was smitten and afflicted for our transgressions, our iniquities. Uh, uh, our, our chastisement was put upon him so we could have peace. He bore our sickness. He carried our pains. Um, we are blessed. Say, say we are absolutely blessed. Not I hope so. If you hear anybody say I hope so, just slap them upside the face. <laughs> we could say this all day. Say it all day. If this is all you say, all day. Now, here, here's, the, here's the fallacy. Get up in the morning and quote a scripture and confess a word of faith and then worry all day long. That is not faith. If you have constant pain in your body, you need a constant word in your mouth. If, you, if you're battling symptoms and, and feeling symptoms all the time in your body, you got to have a constant word in your mouth. A word of healing. A word of breakthrough. I, I would choose this one. Surely he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. Just say that all day long. Every time you feel a tweak and a twerk and a, and a funny little thing in your body or you're, or you're imagining something, say, surely he has borne my pains and carried, or my sicknesses and carried my pains. Make it personal. Make it personal. <clears throat> so don't get confused by making a couple faith confessions in the morning and worrying all day long that you're not in faith. When you are bombarded with symptoms, keep, your, keep the word of God in your mouth and it will change your heart. It will change your heart until your heart becomes believing. You keep the word in your mouth and keep confessing the word in your mouth until your heart believes it. Once your heart believes it, then you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you're saved. You're healed. You're delivered. You're not delivered until your heart believes it. And sometimes it takes a while for your heart to believe. So your mouth just has to say the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. And then your heart one day believes it. And then when you believe it and say it, it works. Glory be to God. I'm glad for that. Are you? Because we don't always just believe in our heart. Right? And so we got something to say. Right? Don't, don't let somebody say to you, well, you know, that's fake. No, that's Bible. That's Bible. Speak the truth. Speak the truth. Whether you believe it or not, who cares? Speak the truth until it becomes a reality in your heart. And then when you speak it from your heart because you believe it, transformation happens. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. In verses 7 and 8, I, I love this. It says, uh, Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before its shears was silent. So he opened not his mouth. Twice it says it. Say Jesus didn't open his mouth. Now we talked about last Saturday night, we talked about how important this was that he didn't open his mouth. Because he had no sin. Absolutely no sin. So if Jesus had said, Lord, and cried out to God the Father and said, Father, I'm sinless. I want to be delivered now. Send 100,000 warring angels. The Father would have had to comply. Because, he, because justice says, one who has no sin cannot be punished. Right? Yes. If there's nothing done wrong, you can't be punished. It's not right to punish somebody that hasn't done anything wrong. And he was the spotless, sinless lamb. So he kept his mouth shut when all of everything in the world, past, present, future, sin, sickness, curse, everything was coming on him. He could have just tweaked his mouth. He could have just said, I'm done, God. Get me out of here. And God would have. That's why it was so important he shut up. Say he couldn't say a thing. And the reason uh, that uh, because he didn't say anything, we can say everything. He died with his mouth shut so we can open ours and win. 
And we looked at Acts 22 and verse 22, I think it was verse 22 to 20 something uh, last week, where the Apostle Paul was being falsely uh, arrested on the streets of Rome and they were going to punish him for the preaching of the gospel. And just as they bound him and the, and the, and the rulers took him, the authorities took him and they were going to beat him, he pulled the citizenship card. You know the story? He pulled the citizenship card and he said, ho, 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 ho. And the Roman centurion said, well, I paid a lot of money to become a Roman citizen. And he said, I was born one. And they all started to back off. You need to read the story if you haven't read it. Acts 22, starting at verse 22. They all backed off because it was illegal to, to take by force a, 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 Roman's, uh, a Roman citizen without trial. And they were going to beat the Apostle Paul. But he didn't keep his mouth shut. Say, he didn't keep his mouth shut. See, we're not in the dispensation to keep your mouth shut. Jesus did that. Jesus kept his mouth shut, shut, so we open ours up. So when the enemy comes with sickness and disease into your house, you have to open your mouth and pull the citizenship card. And you have to say, I'm, the, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm blood bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. No power of wickedness has any right to put and afflict anything upon my body. Get out of my house, Satan, and you have to open your mouth. Well, you know, I'm tired. I don't really feel like it. Well, then die then. You have to open. He kept his mouth shut so you could open yours. Say, Jesus kept his mouth shut. Come on, Canada. <laughs> we got to open our mouths. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, then keep silent. But I'm telling you, when you're silent, we're going to talk about this tonight. This is huge to the victory of being sickness free, disease free. How many want to be disease free? <clears throat> so we talked all about why it's so important through that story of, of the Apostle Paul. Why it's so important to open your mouth and not be silent. I'm a child of God. You have to tell the devil. You have no right to punish me. Your punishment went on Jesus. Back off, Satan. You cannot punish me. Because sickness is punishment for, for sin. My sin has been washed away. My life has been cleansed. I am righteous in Jesus. I'm under his blood. Satan, back off. You're in the wrong family. And you got to mean it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Isaiah is seeing by the Spirit. So the next time sickness tries to get into your life, family, children, open your mouth. Turn to the, to, say, say out loud, I got to get mouthy. I have to get mouthy. You have to. You have to pull the citizenship card. Now, I mentioned just at the end of last Saturday night, I mentioned the fact that a lot of people struggle with healing because of underbrush. So I don't know if you remember what I was saying, but healing is like a tree being cut down, boom, and being placed in your life where you actually believe and understand and, and, and know that you're to walk in divine health, right? But oftentimes, the underbrush holds the tree up. So if you cut the tree down, there's all these little trees that kind of hold the tree from falling to where it's supposed to fall. Well, we're going to deal with underbrush today. So that you can know that you know that you know you're healed. You don't ever, ever try to be healed. Stop trying to be healed because that's unbelief. If you're trying to get healed, you don't believe you're healed. Say, I was healed over 2,000 years ago. So you got to believe you are healed. And when you're facing... Uh, physical things, symptoms, circumstances, situations that push against your life, they are, all f they are all physical things that try to tell you you're not. That's, what, that's all that the devil can use. He can use pain, he can use sorrow, he can use circumstances and symptoms. Everything, the devil is on the outside. 
And he brings pressure and he, and he brings lies and he brings uh, convincing arguments and suggestions and all this junk to, to us to convince us that this is not true. And it is absolutely true. Everything you feel is a lie. Feelings are lying to you all the time. Emotions lie. Feelings lie. They're all against the Word of God. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your emotions. You can't trust your natural mind. You can't trust your perceptions. You can't trust anything. We have to live by faith and not by sight. We have to live out of our inner man and the perceptions of heaven that are on the inside of us. And we have to live out of the truth of the Word of God. And if you live by what you see, you will always lose. Always. Everybody say, always a loser who lives by sight. Say, the righteous are not to live that way. We are not to be moved by what we see. We are not to be moved by what we feel. We are not to be moved by natural circumstances. That's why what has happened this week, I'm telling you, is the most glorious. Yeah. We've, we've had one of the greatest elections we've ever had in this nation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But nobody sees it. No. More are going to see it tomorrow. Right on. We have, we have more things going on in this country right now. But see, people don't even know who they are. Right? Say out loud, I'm healing to the nations. I am healing to the nations. That's, what the, that's the prophetic destiny of Canada. Right? And we're closer than we've ever been before. But people put all their faith in people. The nation's going to change if we get a new prime minister. Since when? Faith is not people. Putting your faith in people will never change a nation. <laughs> people that humble themselves and pray and seek his face, he will hear from heaven. As we turn, he hears from heaven and he heals our land. Every leader has, has their heart in the hand of God and he's able to turn it any way he wants. So the church missed it again, but we're in a good place. Yes, we are. And you're going to hear about it tomorrow. It's exciting. It is exciting. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you, for the sake of time, so we don't spend all night here, I want to look up some scriptures. Because people are are stuck with some stuff and we're going to hit those things head on who somebody look up deuteronomy 32 verse 39 put your hand up okay susan put first samuel 2 verse 6 put your hand up okay cheryl jose hosea 6 1 debbie and one more job 5 18 come on somebody okay Got them all covered. You got, each got your verse so that I don't have, we're not going to take long here. So Susan has Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to come to you so that you're on the 32 verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Now, I want, did you hear it? Who said, I wound and I heal? God, right? God's speaking in that verse. Do you, you see that? He says, I wound and I heal. Right? Okay, who's, who's number two? Cheryl. Cheryl over here. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord kills and makes come alive. He brings to the grave and brings up. Does the Lord kill? Does it say the Lord kills? Yeah. Now we're going to crucify this thing because this is what really messes people up when you say God always wants to heal. Well, I just read he kills. 
I just read he afflicts. Uh, who was number three? Oh, Debbie. Come, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. He has torn and he has stricken. Who's it talking about? God. Right? God says, I have torn and I have stricken. Cheryl? I forget which one it was in Job 5. What was it? Job? Job 5.18. Job 5.18. Good. For he maketh the sore, bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. He wounds, and his hands make whole. Everybody say, he wounds. He wounds. So we see four scriptures. There's many. There's many scriptures. There's four scriptures we've just read that says God wounds. He, he, he afflicts, he uh, makes sick, he curses, right? First person, it says he. Now, when you look at, hang with me now. If you look at, uh, well, just let me make an explanation. In the Hebrew, all right, in the Hebrew language, <clears throat> there is no such thing, or uh, I got it backwards, in the English language, there is no such thing as a permissive verb. There is no such thing. Do you, do you know what a permissive verb is? A per, do you know what a verb is? All right. And a, 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 the action part of your sentence. sentence. A permissive verb is, is a verb that in Hebrew allows something to happen but it's not the person necessarily doing it, but it's allowed to be done, all right? Because we don't have permissive verbs in English, every permissive verb in the Old Testament and the New uh, is translated, God does it, God did it, God did it, but it's not God doing it. It's like Exodus chapter 12. It says, in Exodus chapter 12, it says, that he's going to, uh, he tells the people of Israel to kill the Passover lamb. Remember the story? And he says, I will pass over and kill the firstborn of every Egyptian. It says, I will pass over and kill the firstborn of every Egyptian. Who's the I? God. But it's a permissive verb. So what it's saying is, we've translated it God. But God is saying, I will allow this to happen. We know God allows it to happen because just in the very same chapter, just a few verses later, it's, called, it, it's the angel of death. Well, the angel of death isn't God, but he said, I. Are you with me? We're killing the shrub, the shrub brush underneath the tree. <laughs> so... The permissive verbs of the Old Testament Hebrew permit certain things to happen, but it is not God doing it, all right? And all of those times that those permissive verbs are found, they are translated, I, God did it, he did it. I, and that's what messes people up. Everybody say, that's what messes people up. So God passes judgment and he allows the destroyer access. Who's the destroyer? Who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? The devil. God doesn't steal anything. He doesn't take anything from us. He doesn't destroy us. He's not a destroyer. He's a giver of life and more abundant. He, he is, he is uh, in him there is no variation nor any shadow of turning. He's good all the time. He's good all the time. Now we know that, but we read so many times in the Old Testament that he does this and he does that and he does this. It's because of this permissive verb that we don't have in English. So we just say God did, God did it, God did it, God did it. God allows judgment. Everybody say God allows judgment. Now, he does because he's just. He's a just God. Now, somebody look up Judges 2.14 for me. 
Judges 2 and verse 14. Who wants to read it? Come on, you got to be fast. <laughs> okay, 2.14. Okay, read, read it out loud. 2.14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. So what is that? God is judging Israel, right? He is judging the people of God. Why? Because they're making a mess. Why? Because they're not acting right. <laughs> they're not following him. So he's, he's ticked off. So he allows them, listen, when you think of the judgment of God, you have to think it's allowing the destroyer and the destruction to come. It's not him doing it. Say, it's not God doing it. God would never do it. But he will allow the destroyer to come. Everybody say it out loud. <laughs> so many people you're going to run across are going to say, well, you know, I read in the Bible, God did this and God did this and God did this and God did this. God didn't do it. He allowed the destroyer to come. He passed judgment because he's just. And we're going to get to this in a minute. When it says God did it, is God passing judgment and allowing it? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes. So we have to understand this. <clears throat> because God does pass judgment, even in the New Testament, even now. Which allows the destroyer access. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They both die, right? In the New Testament. It was a judgment call. I said it was a judgment call. The destroyer was given access. Whenever there's a judgment by the Lord uh, in a situation and, and he weighs the justice of the situation. And I want to show you uh, uh, just how good our God is. Go with me to Lamentations. Okay. I know these are nice books you yeah. You just constantly read from here all the time, just to pick up your spirits. <laughs> Lamentation. Get to Jeremiah and go right. I think it's right there. <clears throat> yeah, right after Jeremiah. Lamentation, uh, and I'm going to read verse, uh, ch chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. Now, I know we're looking at a lot of scripture, but it's so important. We're, gonna, we're burning out the scrub brush so that the tree of healing can land where it needs to land in your life. <clears throat> and if you're watching online, it's, it, God is a God who always, always heals. Always. And yet sometimes he'll pass judgment and allow the destroyer to come. Because of justice. Now watch verse 22 though. Lamentations 3, 22. Through the Lord's mercies we are consumed, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Say God is good, he's faithful, and praise God he's patient. Verse 31, Lamentations 3, 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes sickness, there it is. Yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Verse 33, underline it. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. It is never God's pleasure. He is never pleased to cause the, or to allow the destruction or the destroyer to come to your life. He does, he's so patient in letting it not happen. But when he does have to eventually pass judgment, it's only temporary 
and he hates it. Are you, are you here? It's just like you and your kids. There's some times when they're not acting right. <laughs> you just can't give them everything they want. Right? And you gotta, you've got to allow them to go through some stuff, right? Right? You have to let them go through some stuff so because they're not listening. They don't listen to mom and dad anymore. They don't listen to the parents anymore. So, so they got to figure it out on their own and go through some hard knocks. Yeah. Right? Well, that's God. God allows the ones he loves to experience his justice, his judgment, which brings in the, which gives access to the destroyer, the one who destroys. Uh, but it's not supposed to last very long, and it's, it's never his pleasure. He never enjoys it. He never gets anything out of it. He hates it because he wants the best for his kids. Now, you got to understand this. Say, i got to understand this. Okay, we're talking about the judgment of God. Sickness is judgment. Because access to uh, having sickness and disease or, or, or things breaking down in your body is the result of God passing judgment and allowing the destroyer into your life. God never makes you sick. He never uses it to teach you something. He never, ever, ever does it. But he'll allow it. If we've allowed ourselves to go... See, now I hear the wheels. Well, what have I ever done to allow this to come into my life? This cancer, this, 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 this whatever this is. What have I ever done? <laughs> see, that's where, that's where we're blinded to ourselves. Right? If it's happened... Where something has attacked your body, it's because judgment has been allowed and the destroyer has come because he has access. You have to admit it. But there is an answer, and we will get to that. Go with me to 1 Timothy, the first chapter. You okay? How many want to learn why some things happen? Right? God never does it. God never, listen to me online, God never makes you sick. God never allows punishment to come against you or causes punishment to come against you. He allows it. 1 Timothy in the New Testament. Everybody over there? Except me? First <clears throat> Timothy 1. I'll start to read at verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So the Apostle Paul is telling his son Timothy, you fight the fight of faith and war against the enemy with the prophecies that are over your life. Everybody in this house should be waging a war of prophecy with that word right there. This is my breakthrough year. Devil, back off. This is my breakthrough year. Devil, back off. This, that's, your, that's your warfare prayer right there. You don't need to know anything. You just need to know that one word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, verse 19, Having faith and good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. And then he names some. Verse 20. Of whom are Hymenaeus, and, and Alexander, who I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul said, I turned these two men over to Satan. I, what he's saying is, I have allowed these to face the destroyer. Because judgment is being passed. Because they are blaspheming the work of the gospel. Wow. So New Testament judgment by the Apostle Paul right here as plain as day. He is judging these two men. He names their names because they've been judged. They're in the Bible. <laughs> 
you know, forever their names are in the Bible as blasphemers. Because they were turned over to the power of the destroyer because of the way they were behaving in the body of Christ. We're so far from this. We give somebody a hug and say it's okay. But that is not Bible. Bible is so... <laughs> judgment is huge. Say, judgment is huge. The Spirit of the Lord is the one who judges. Say, Holy Spirit judges. But God passes judgment because of his justice system that allows the destroyer uh, access. But it grieves God. It does not please God. He doesn't do it willingly, and he certainly doesn't want it to last very long. That's the heart of God. Say, that's the heart of my Father. But he is a righteous judge, and he knows everything on the earth. And what we have to contend with is this, that we have to decide if punishment is in my body, I'm being judged. Say, there's a way out. Say, I always got to stay on God's side. Don't let your head go funny now. Right here at this point, this is where people go funny. <clears throat> I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm a good person. I read my Bible. I go to church. I pray. I'm trying to live a good Christian life. Who does God think he is? How's he judging me? The minute you get into that, the minute you go there, it's you against God. Yeah. Say, that's not a good place to be. If sickness is in your body, you've been judged. If the flu comes into my house, I'm being judged. You've got to settle this in your heart. This is a big issue. If my body is wearing out, if something's going wrong, in my life, and this applies to finances, this applies to relationships, this applies to everything that Jesus has redeemed us for. Glory be to God. So I'll say, I have to stay on God's side. No matter, no matter if I understand it or not. If I, because we don't have to know everything. Right? We don't have to ask why. Why? Why would he allow that? Why would he allow me to have cancer? I'm a good person. I teach Bible class. You're being judged. Say, say, judgment is the justice of God. And if it's happening, he sees fit to allow it, not to do it. But he feels, it's basically like he takes our, his hand off of us and allows us access to the destroyer. You can live in absolute divine health. You can live absolutely prosperous. You can live in perfect relationship. But we're human. We make mistakes. And if we, if, if in his patience he's waited long enough, he will allow access of the destroyer to come. Settle it. This is really good to know. Because we can come through it. We can get out of it. Because God is always good. God is always merciful. He doesn't like it when we're being destroyed. He doesn't like it when sickness and disease is on upon us, when we don't have enough finances, when, when things are breaking down relationally. He doesn't like all that. Say he doesn't like it. It doesn't please him. He's not doing it and going, <laughs> he's not that kind of a God. Like some people think he's got this big bat and he's just swinging it. And he, he's like, he's not like that. He loves us all. Say he is love. He loves me. Yes, he loves and in his justice and in his judgment, he's helping me. Yes, it's not to drive, me a, drive a wedge between me and him. It's to get me to come into his presence and figure out what I'm doing. Yes, what I'm doing. Yeah. That isn't pleasing to the Lord. Yeah, so Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, God does not judge in a hurry. He's not impatient. He waits and he waits and he, he says, maybe, oh, give him a couple more months. Maybe they'll turn around. Maybe a couple more years. They'll turn around. That's why people can go so long and it seems like they're getting away with stuff. 
but you never get away with stuff. Eventually, justice catches up. But our God is patient and he loves us and his love is enduring and, I, and there's grace and glory be to God, I need to praise him that I'm not dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's true. He's good. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're learning how to stay healed. Yes, we are. You're going to get healed tonight. Yes, we are. Praise God. First Corinthians chapter 11, go right down to verse, well, go to verse 24. And it says, and when he had given thanks, the apostle Paul in, in the church of Corinth, he broke bread and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, he instituted communion and obliterated Passover. The last Passover... He, he, he transformed Passover into communion. This is what you do from now on. Passover is now obsolete. I'm transforming at the cross Passover into communion. Passover does not exist for the blood-bought believer. Communion does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. So, then, so then he goes on, read with me. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eat, now watch, verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself so as as so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself listen of the results Dis, uh, drinks judgment to himself not discerning the lord's body for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many are asleep or are dead or have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Woo! Now, I don't know about you. If you got that, you should be shouting. <laughs> God is a just God and he will judge us, but we don't have to go through that. We don't have to go through his judgment. We can constantly judge ourselves. Somebody say, I got to judge my own life. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We don't judge our brother or sister. Say, I don't judge somebody else. Because if I judge somebody else's life, that same judgment comes back on me. Actually, it's worse. God says, you know, you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye, you got a log in yours. If you're judging somebody else or you're trying to set somebody free from having a sliver in their eye, it's because you got a massive log in yours. Say, so I don't want to be log-eyed. <laughs> so we're not to judge our brothers and sisters. We're not to go, nah, 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 you need to, you know, because that puts it back on us. We judge ourselves. Say, I must judge my, hallelujah. <laughs> Say, God is a good judge. He's a just judge. And if his people will not judge themselves, he will judge. He will. Over time, being patient, loving us, hoping we'll change. He will eventually judge because he's just. And he has to allow justice. And we talked last week why justice is so important. Because if, if he had just went in the garden after the sin of, of Adam and Eve and just gave them a big hug and say, you know, I know you had a tough day today and you kind of rejected me, but, you know, we're good. If he had done that, I mean, no, he couldn't do that. He had to justify the sin. 
The reason God had to justify the sin, because when we get to the end of this thing, Satan will stand up and say, listen, you just gave him a big hug. Adam and Eve just got a big hug and got, just go on. Why do you, you can't judge me? How many know Satan's going to be judged? Everybody's judged, right? And we're judged by a faithful God, a good God who's on our side. But he eventually, after patience has run out and situations and circumstances have went on too long, he has to allow justice, he has to judge us if we won't judge ourselves. What it, what, what's he saying? If you won't judge yourself, I'm going to have to judge you. And all that is is making access for the destroyer to come and make you sick and punishment and c curses. Let them come back on you because... You're not honoring me. You're not, you're not respecting me. You're not doing what I want. And you're not judging yourself. You're not judging yourself. And that's why it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, many are sick. Many. Now, what was going on historically, we know what was happening. When they had communion, it was a meal. Because they transitioned Passover into this communion meal. So people would come and they'd be starving. And they'd sit down at the table and, rah, 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 and they're just pigging out. They're eating before everybody gets there. The apostles haven't even arrived yet. And people are eating in an unworthy manner because it's all about the food and they're not discerning the body. Right? It's not, not, it's not like what we do today. We don't really, uh, really sit down and have a meal. We're going to have communion before this is over and you're going to get healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say, I have, to, I have to do something about judgment. I have, to, I have to judge myself. He gave me the ability to judge myself. Hallelujah. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. <clears throat> say, I'm not to judge my brother. <laughs> I judge myself. If we don't want sickness and death and curses to control our lives, our physical lives, our financial lives, our relationship lives, then we have to learn how to consistently repent. Repentance is the sign that you're, you recognize you're off track. In order to repent, you have to humble... I repent every day, and I don't do it religiously. I don't take communion either every day, but I do repent every day, every day. Lord, things I have seen and haven't seen, forgive me. It's just bringing yourself low, right? Keeping yourself humble and judging yourself. And not just running along for months on end thinking everything's all right. And not communicating to God and not, not interacting with the presence of the Lord because you've separated. Your, that's sin. That's sin as a Christian. We're not to separate ourselves from the Lord. Any kind of separation, well, I've just been busy. Well, that's too bad. You've just been sinning. And if you do it long enough, man, God's patient. Praise God for his grace. Thank the Lord he's merciful. Hallelujah. But if you do it long enough, he's going to allow judgment, which gives access to the destroyer. And so what happens is the car accident. Or what happens is the sickness. Or what happens is the breakdown. Or something happens. And it's the mercy of God you're not dead. Hallelujah. Because the destroyer has been given access over a period of long suffering. Our father is long suffering. He will suffer long, way longer than a human. He will suffer long to get us to turn ourselves. Right? To judge ourselves. That's turning our own. Don't get yourself going on a road that you're so busy you don't have time. Da, 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 da. Yeah, because he'll judge you eventually. Right? And that's why so many were sick. And they weren't discerning the body. So people were coming to communion and they, they weren't thinking about the body of Christ. They weren't thinking about anything but feeding their stomach. They hadn't eaten all day. All this kind of stuff was going on. And so Paul said, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Don't eat this in, the un, in an unworthy manner. This is about the blood covenant that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. We're in the new covenant. 
Old things have passed away. All things have become new. This is a spiritual covenant. Wake up, church. The reason you're sick and so many have died is the way you're doing this thing. Hallelujah. So we don't judge somebody else. We judge ourselves. In Job chapter 1, and I'm going to give you these scriptures, and then I'm just going to tell, them, tell you, and then we're going to pray. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says that Job was blameless. He was upright. He feared God. He shunned evil. He put the devil to flight. But somehow, and there's a lot of theories, and I have one, but it doesn't matter. Somehow, Satan got a case against Job. Right? There's no way, there is no way God allows uh, the destroyer unless judgment has been passed. So somehow, he got judged, Job, <clears throat> and he gets attacked. But we know that in a period of weeks, he gets healed and double what he lost, right? <clears throat> but something opened him up to judgment, because if there was nothing there, he could not have been judged, all right? Let's settle that. Then in Job 9, 32 and to 35, uh, Job comes to the realization he's been judged. He says, man, I've been judged. And you know what he says? I need a mediator. That's what he says. He says, I, I need somebody between me and God. We got, I got to have, have me a mediator because I'm not getting across to God and I don't know what he's doing and I can't figure out what's going on. I need somebody in between. And then in Job 16, verse 21, it's, he says literally this. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God. As a man pleads for his neighbor, I need an intercessor. I need a mediator. Listen to me, church. Do we have one of those? <laughs> Do we have an intercessor? Do we have a mediator? Yeah, we got somebody between us and God. We have what 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says. We have an advocate. We have a lawyer. We have a defense lawyer. Glory be to God. Say, I got a defense lawyer. <laughs> Judgment might have been passed, but I got a lawyer. I got a good lawyer. Woo! I got, I got lawyer in high places. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody say, a lawyer in high places. Jesus, our Savior, sitting at the right hand of the Father, is our mediator. He is our high priest of our confession. Hebrews 3.1. He's the high priest of my confession. Now, this is, this is crucial. This phrase right here. Say, he's my advocate. He is my advocate. He's, my he is my he's my mediator. He's between me and God. He me. He's the high priest of my confession. He Hebrews 3.1. He's the high... He's my high priest. He's my mediator. He's my lawyer. He, he, goes, he goes to the throne on my behalf... He is my defense. He's my intercessor. He never ceases intercessing. These are, all, these are all judicial terms. He's my justice in heaven. Say, I have to judge myself. In order, I have to judge myself correctly in order for my lawyer to work on my behalf. So let me say it this way. I have to judge myself correctly. Or my mediator. My high priest. Whatever way you want to look at Jesus. He's my high priest. He's my mediator. He's my lawyer. He's my advocate. He's all that. It's based on my confession. So if I believe lies. That the enemy has given me and said, you know, well, God doesn't heal everybody. You know, it's not the will of God that everybody gets healed. It's not the will of God that everybody prospers. It's not the will of God that, uh, and I, I make that my confession. Then my meteor, mediator, my lawyer, has nothing to work with. Say, my lawyer can only take me on my confession. If I feel I'm a loser, if I say I'm not worthy, if I say I'm beaten, come on, come on. then the judgment that has taken place against my life is viable. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm sick in my body. I got four stage cancer. I'm dying with cancer. But I'm a, ch a child of God. I'm blood bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. My confession determines what my advocate, my mediator can do on my behalf. So if I say, well, you know, I've lived a hard life. I guess it's catching up with me. I guess I deserve cancer. Everybody's got to go out somehow. You know, all the junk, all the stuff people say. That's what their confession is. Their advocate cannot go to the Father. Jesus, our mediator, cannot stand in front of the Father and say anything except what we believe and say. So if I feel I'm defeated, if I feel I'm not worthy, if I feel that, you know, well, this is just the way it is and this is how God always does and, you know, good, good people die and, and good people have problems like this and, and this is just normal and I, that's my confession. Jesus has got nothing. So the judgment stands. The judgment stands. God's judged us. He's allowed the destroyer to come because of sin that's in our life, Right? We all, do, we all do dumb things. So the judgment has been allowed. Uh, uh, the destroyer has had access. God's allowed it. He doesn't like it. He's not pleased with it. He's patient. He waited a long time. But finally, he had to let it happen. And now we go, oh, well, I guess it's the will of God. You're done. Because your mediator has got nothing to work with. But if you stand up and pull the citizenship card... Despite your behavior, despite anything that you've done, and you go, who, who? Jesus, I got four stage cancer, but I'm yours. I'm blood bought. I, I, I believe in you, Lord Jesus. I know I've been judged because I haven't been judging myself very good because I've been kind of living like hell and forgetting about you. But now I need a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. I need a lawyer right now. And I'm under your blood. And I believe in you, Jesus. You took it all for me. Now Jesus can turn to the Father as my advocate lawyer and say, listen, yes, he's being punished. Yes, he's going through uh, the hands of the destroyer because he wasn't judging himself. But now he recognizes who he is in the kingdom of God. And he, and, and he, and he, and he stands up and he says, I'm blood bought and I don't have the right to be punished. Because Jesus knew he took the punishment. I don't have the right to be punishment. I'm not, I'm not like what they say I am. I, I may be messed up, but I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And I stand before you, Lord. And then Jesus turns and says, I got a lot to say about this guy. He's been under judgment. The destroyer's been working. But he understands who he is in the kingdom. He's your child, God. We got to remove the destruction. And God says, Amen. Because it's the will of God to heal. It's the will of God to set people free and, and prosper them. But they have to be able to see who they are in order to get their lawyer to work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See how simple it is? It doesn't matter how you feel. Well, I feel sick. It doesn't, who cares? Yeah, who cares? You have a citizenship. Yeah. You're an ambassador. Yes, You're not of this world. Yeah. You're a new creation in Christ. You have to pull the citizenship card. You have to say, Lord, I've been purchased. Lord, judgment has come. You've allowed the destruction to hit my life, my body, my finances, my relationships. But God, I'm back. Jesus, I know who I am. You paid it all. Take it from me. Take the judgment. Take the destruction. Take all this from me. I'm judging myself. I need a good lawyer. Jesus turns to the Father as our lawyer. And he says, he's back. She's back. Heal them. And the healing come. Every time. Because when you cry out that way with your citizenship card, you have remembered the Lord. That's what communion's about. Remembering the Lord. Here's what the devil does. He takes your past and he makes it all messed up. And God's been good back there in some things. And you have to remember. That means you have to put it back together. Remember. 
member it. You have to put it back together that God's been good, that I'm in God, that Jesus paid the price. That's what communion's about, remembering until the return of the Lord. We remember what he's done. We don't come and drink the juice, right? We don't come and eat the bread and go, ooh, ooh. We remember that Jesus paid the price. We remember, that's why he set the Lord's table up. Do this in remembrance of me. Take a piece of the bread, right? He said, first, the bread. We're going to do that in just a second. He said, take a piece of the bread. This bread is broken for you. Now, we know Jesus' body was not broken. He had no broken bones, according to the book of Psalms. So what's he talking about? It's not his body that was broken. He, f he fragmented his body up into us. Say, I'm a part of the body of Christ. So we all partake as a part, joined together by the anointing. We take a part, we, we, we take the bread, and we are saying, I'm part of the body. I'm part of the body. I'm remembering, he said, I'm part of the body. The body has been broken for me. I'm in it because he fragmented it so we could all be part and make it whole because he was the body of Christ, but now he's in heaven, and now we're the body of Christ. Glory be to God. And he broke it for me. So it's not just about doing the little ritual, eating the little bread and drinking the little wine. We have been grafted in to the body. We are the body of Christ. Not all of it, but all together in the world, we're the body of Christ. That's why he broke the bread. He said, now, broken for you. I got to go be with the Father, but greater things are you going to do because I go to be with my Father. It's been broken for you. There's access for you. You can get into the body now. Hallelujah. That's why it's important that we do this in remembrance of him. They're just pigging out. That's what they were doing. Coming to the Lord's table. No, not even thinking about the body. And then many were sick and afflicted. Say, we got to understand. Say, I got to understand that. I, I'm judging myself. And I judge myself by remembering him. Say, I judge myself by remembering Jesus. What he paid for. How he substituted his life. How he stood in for me. I remember what he's done. He took my place. He took my punishment. That's why people get healed in communion services. Because they actually remember what he's done. He's my healer. He took my pains. He took my sicknesses and disease. He carried them for me. I don't have to carry them anymore. I participate in the body. I take the bread and I say I'm part of that body. And then I drink the blood, which is the New Testament covenant. The power of the Holy Ghost. The power of heaven and the divine essence of God flowing into the body. The power of a new covenant. Not a covenant of humanitarian aid. A covenant of supernatural power. A covenant that casts out devils, heals the sick, a Mark 16 covenant. Woo. I remember the covenant. And I remember the body. And I remember I'm in, and I remember I'm covered in the blood. No sickness and disease can be around. So we keep from being judged by remembering what Jesus did. Say, we remember... What Jesus did, he broke his body, he let us in, then he gave us his blood, and he said, now you're anointed, each and every one of you, and if you stand together in those anointings, you'll do greater things, so many great things will happen, hallelujah, 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 Job's crying his whole letter, his whole thing there with his friends. I need a mediator. I need a mediator. I need an advocate. I need a judge. I need a lawyer in heaven. I need somebody to stand between God and I. And what happens? A few 
hundred years later, thousands of years later, we got one. Hallelujah. I, I'm just profoundly interested in the fact that Job could see that he needed a, he needed a, a, a covenant partner. He needed a, a brother in the Lord. He needed somebody to stand between. And that God, thousands of years later, isn't it awesome? Job's the first Bible written in the, or first book written in the Bible. It's the first book of the Bible. Hundreds of years before any other book was written. And this guy had an understanding. I need somebody to work on my behalf. I'm being judged. And we got it. So we remember it. And then to keep from being judged, we also humble. So we got to remember what Jesus did, right? Through his blood, through his body. But then we also, to keep from being judged, humble ourselves and judge ourselves through repentance. Lord, I'm sick. I've got off track. I'm misaligned. Something's happened. Something's caused me to experience symptoms or, or a lack or something's happened. So I humble myself and I remember what you did. Remember what you said and what you provided for me. I humble myself. You're my lawyer. Work on my behalf. Pride is put down. When I judge myself, when I judge myself, my advocate can go to work. When I judge myself, the judgment of God has to be removed because my advocate can go to work. My lawyer. He's humbled. She's humbled. They're crying out. They don't understand what's going on. God resists James 4, 6. God resists the prideful, but he gives grace to the humble. Lord, help me. I've done something. Something has happened. I judge myself, Lord. You know, so many people are sick because they're tired and they don't eat right. Probably half of the sicknesses and diseases. <clears throat> Mental illness is always a spiritual problem. And the hospitals are filling up with chemical imbalances and and mental illnesses and all these mental health issues. When, since when has it's called demons? It's demons. It's misaligned, and it should never be in the church. Depression should never be in the church. Oppression, suppression, lack of any kind should never be in the church. Sickness should never be in the church. There are things God hates. There's things. There's things that He has allowed through His judgment. But he wants us to remember Jesus and he wants us to humble ourselves and he wants us to get ourselves back on track and he'll fix it. He'll heal all our sicknesses. He'll, 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 he'll prosper our businesses. All these things begin to shift when we humble ourselves. We don't have to fix everything. He does it. All we have to do is get ourselves in position with him. Remember what he's done. Remember what he's done. He broke the body so we can come in. He poured out his blood. So we have a covenant of power. We remember that. Now we humble ourselves and say, Lord, something's happened in my life and I'm battling this sickness and it's punishment and I'm being judged. I'm now judging myself. Lord, if there's anything that I've done to cause this to come into my life, I repent. Show me what I must turn from. Show me what I must do. 99% of the time, you know. You know what you got to change. You're doing it anyway. You got to end that. I said, you got to end that. You may have had mercy for 20 years, but eventually it catches up. If you're doing things you know you're not supposed to do, it's called sin. He's so patient. But if you won't judge yourself, he will judge you. Why did Ananias and Sapphira die in the New Testament? They lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, when most people hear that, they go, well, we do that all the time and we don't die. Right. And we don't have God like they did. God wants to manifest his glory. And in order to get us there, we got to become purified. 
Because his glory will kill you. His glory will kill you if there's sin in your life. If he came in in the fullness of his glory, we'd all lay to here dead. But he wants to get us aware and he wants to bring us and judge ourselves and get us purified and healed. And then he's going to come. Well, watch when he comes. There's going, to be, there's going to be international revival. This nation is going to be saved. Healing is going to come to the nations through this nation. Canada has been raised up for the last days to bring healing to the nations. It's just going to come because, because his presence is going to come because the church is becoming what it's supposed to become in the midst of Babylon. Well, I want Babylon to change. No, you got to change. So I'm going to change. <laughs> the country's going to change when we change. Right? Hallelujah. Well, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. Just a little, just a few of us here, but this is something I've just felt to do tonight. Every one of you are worthy to come to this table after what you just heard. <laughs> You're all worthy, right? Just, just judge yourself. If there's some things that are going on in your life that aren't right, fix it. Just repentance is, Lord, I'm going to turn from that. I'm not going to do that no more. There's been such a false grace message pushed on the church that we can live any way we want and have power. Wrong. You can live any way you want and not be blessed, but go to heaven. But you won't have the goodness of God in your life on the earth in everything you're doing if you're living like hell. You can still go to heaven if you've got Jesus in your heart. But who wants to live like hell on earth and then go to heaven? Why not live like heaven on earth? And then when you get to heaven, you get graduated pretty fast into, into places and positions faster than other people. Because what you don't learn here, you have to learn there. I said, what you don't learn here, you have to learn there. Hallelujah. Well, it'll be easy there, will it? <clears throat> Just imagine being a born-again crack addict. All right? You go to heaven. Your crack magnification level intensifies. You go to heaven, you've got to get delivered. And there's no access. What you don't learn here, you learn there. <laughs> Heaven's glorious. Heaven's fun. We just have total freedom. What you don't learn here, you have to learn there. If you don't have disciplines here that, you, that you're supposed to have here, you will get them there. You have to go through some sort of system to get discipline. There are levels and degrees of heaven. People enter at different places. There are different levels of robes and crowns and things that are received when you go in. When Jesse de Planetis went to heaven, he said there were some people that were in paradise for years, never even entered heaven. heaven. Paradise is outside of heaven. And they had to eat fruit in order to walk because the glory was so strong and they were so weak. They had to strengthen themselves with these, with these fruit. Other people just walked right past them, went right to the throne. What you don't learn here, you learn up there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that doesn't mean you're depressed and sick and have all that kind of... I'm not talking about that. It's fun. You're all going to be great. But why not move yourself right in? Right on. Right in the throne room. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Say, judge myself. So we're going to participate. How about... If you want to receive communion tonight, now what's going to happen? Now, nobody's going to lay hands on you. Listen to me online. If you have a little piece of bread or grape juice or some juice or water, I don't care what you have, go go grab it right now. If you want to take uh, uh, communion, just come to the front. <clears throat> Everybody come to the front. We're going to do this pretty quick. Now, while we're doing this, you've heard it. Come right up. Come right up. We're going to make a line. Um, while we're doing this, remember what I said. You get judged. If you're sick in your body, you've been judged. Tonight, you're going to judge yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. Judge yourself. And then get your advocate working. Your healing begins to happen. 
right? Do you understand? Start judging yourself every day. Every day. Just get up in the morning and say, I submit to you, Holy Spirit. Love you. Guide me today. If there's anything I've done, said, I want to clean it up and put it under the blood. There's sins that we commit, and then there's sins that we don't know about. All those kinds of things will bring judgment. There's no excuse if you're ignorant. It's scary what's happening in our country. We're keeping the church ignorant on purpose to make it big. It'll eventually catch up. It's going to catch up. Because there's what is called the sin of omission. So people will stand and, and have all kinds of things happening to them and they won't know why. What have we done? I haven't done I'm a good person because they've told, been told all you have to do is be a good person. Right? And there's gonna, people are going to have to figure it out. We're blessed because we've already figured it out. A.W. Tozer, I just read this this afternoon. You know what he said? He said there's a coming age that's coming that they're going to spend all their efforts filling buildings instead of filling people. And that was a generation ago or so. Pardon? There's coming a time, A.W. Tozer said, that we're going to spend all our efforts on filling buildings instead of filling people. Because the gospel is about filling people. The church is you. Right? But if we think the church is this... And we have to get it full. We're in sin. Judgment will come. Eventually. But God is patient. <laughs> Long suffering. And I'm, pray- and I'm praying for revival in every mega church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So, take a piece of the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Just break it off. Yeah, you can do that if you want. I'll come behind you. <clears throat> okay, don't get distracted. <laughs> Just keep going here. <laughs> now, what's going to happen here is in this process, and hopefully you've had enough time at home to get some bread and to get some water, juice, whatever you got in liquid form. Um, <clears throat> I don't recommend alcohol. Um, Just grab something and then... And then God's going to heal you. This is the body of Christ broken for us. We talked about it. Right? We are the body of Christ. I'll take a piece. Jesus didn't have a broken bone. He was not broken. He broke the bread saying, now you can get in to the body. I was the body. Now you're the body. It's been broken for you. Say, I'm part of the body. That's why it's weird when people take communion by themselves. It's strange. People think, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but the body of Christ is people. Being part of the body of Christ, recognizing your part, not isolating yourself and taking it alone. If you take it alone, recognize that all around the world, (laughs) there's the body of Christ and you're you're in it. (laughs) All right? So this is the body of Christ broken for us. Do this, when you eat this, do it in remembrance of him. Okay, Debbie, you want to come? When you graft yourself into the body of Christ, and when you recognize the new covenant that you're in, healing flows. Fifty, sixty, seventy years ago, people would get healed every communion service because they understood it. They understood what was happening. I'm in the body. The body of Christ can't be sick. Was the body of Christ ever sick? No. When he was here, he was never sick. His body here should never be sick. I'm in the body. 
And not only am I in the body, I have his blood covenant. All the divine essence of God was put in Jesus' blood. God has no blood. But the, the blood type of the children always come from the father. Every time. So the father determines the blood type of the child. But God had no blood. But he had a virgin child. So he took his divine essence and put it into the blood of Jesus. All God was was in his blood. And this is the blood covenant we have. We're washed in that blood. So by the, by the covenant of God's blood, and through Jesus Christ, outpouring of the blood, we receive the new covenant. There's a pill behind you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. We thank you, Lord, for your communion, your presence, your power. We thank you and remember what you did on the cross for us. We remember how you broke the bread so we could come into the covenant, into the body, and be anointed and under the power of your blood covenant through your poured out blood that God put in you, that imperishable blood, worth so much. So much power, it drives out devils. So much power, sickness cannot stay. So much power that there cannot be infirmity or lack of any kind in our life. Curses broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Freedom flow in the blood of Jesus Christ. Every punishment that you took, every substitutional act that you did on our behalf, we receive it tonight. We believe in your presence. We believe in your power. And we believe in the access that we have in your body. And Lord God, we say in the name of Jesus Christ, we have been healed 2,000 years ago. <laughs> now give him praise. Come on. Because that's the good news report. The good news report is we are healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My business does prosper. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My life is healthy. My mind is sound. Strategies come to me. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. No weapon formed against me can prosper because I'm in the covenant of God. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, you've just had a good report. Glory be to God. Come on. That should make your countenance change. Does something on the inside, and everything around you is about to shift in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen.